What's up, guys? Alagon Kiri here. And yes, this title was a little bit clickbaity, but that's okay because it got you to click the video, and that's a good thing for you because I'm about to present you with a boatload of valuable information to help you improve your vertical jump. Now, when it comes to improving vertical jump performance, there's already a heck of a lot of information out there. Some of it good, but most of it not so good. I know you've all heard the saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. Well, I'm all about teaching people how to fish, and that's what I'm going to do today. The title wasn't a lie. I will provide you with the only four exercises you'll ever really need to improve your jumping performance. But I'm also going to teach you the whys and the hows behind it all. Because if you understand the mechanics of the process, then you'll understand how to continually tweak it to maximize your progress in the long run. You'll know what changes to make and when to make them based on what physical qualities are deficient relative to each other, and you'll no longer be reliant on me or anyone else to tell you what the next step is. So on that note, let's get to it. As a little bit of background on me, in case you're new to the channel, I'm just a dude who likes to lift weights and be athletic. My main goal is to be as strong as possible, but I also want to be able to run fast, jump high and jump far, and be in good enough shape to be able to keep going when the going gets tough. I've squatted 525 pounds in powerlifting competition in the 148 pound weight class. And at a body weight of 155 pounds, I've deadlifted 585 pounds, power clean 265 pounds, power snatched 220 pounds, and jerked 320 pounds overhead. In addition to this, I've also run a sub 4.5 second 40 yard dash, vertical jumped over 40 inches, and broad jumped nearly 10 and a half feet. I wasn't born being able to do these things, but rather I built up to them over a period of years through diligent and intelligent training. In fact, in 2008, I tried to walk on to the football team at my university, and at the tryout, I distinctly remember vertical jumping a measly 29 inches. Now, that was from a standstill, so I probably could have hit 33 or 34 with a run-up, but it was nowhere near the 40 plus inches I'm capable of now after years of proper power training. I've been studying strength training and athletic performance enhancement for the last decade and putting my knowledge and body to the test through my own training the whole time. So today, I just want to condense for you the primary pieces of information that I found to be most useful when it comes specifically to improving vertical jump performance both some of the technical bits to give you insight into why things are structured the way they are, sorry about the thunder, as well as practical stuff that you'll be able to take with you today and implement into your own training immediately. It's a little bit of a doozy, but if this is a subject you're interested in, it's definitely worth a watch. Now, before I divulge the exercises, we first need to go over some basic physics so you understand exactly why each exercise is so important and what role each one plays in the grand scheme of improving jumping performance. So, jumping right in, we know that the vertical jump is a function of power, and power can be measured using the very simple equation of force times velocity. Thus, if we want to improve vertical jump performance, we must improve power production. From our formula, we can see that there are two ways to increase power in any given movement. The first is to increase the amount of force you're capable of producing in that movement. The second is to increase the speed with which the movement is performed. Sounds so simple, right? This leads me to what's known as the force velocity curve. On the x-axis is velocity, or speed of movement, and on the y-axis is force. You can surmise from this graph that movements involving very high force outputs occur at low velocities, and that movements that occur at very high velocities involve much lower force outputs. If we assign some hypothetical numbers to specific points along the curve, we can see that not much power is generated by activities that exist either at the very top of the curve or at the very bottom of the curve. Maximal power output is actually generated by activities that exist smack dab in the middle of the curve. This might lead you to conclude that we should focus all of our training efforts on the middle of the curve so that we're constantly generating maximal power while we're training. The problem with this logic, however, is that while the force velocity curve can straighten out, it cannot become convex. Therefore, focusing solely on the middle section of the curve would lead to premature stagnation of progress. Thus, if increased power is the ultimate goal, for the best long-term results, rather than just focusing on the middle of the curve, 
we need to focus on shifting the entire curve outward. And that means we need to direct our efforts towards multiple points across the force velocity curve. Now, along this curve exists what's known as the strength speed continuum. The strength speed continuum describes all the different physical qualities that must be honed in order to shift the entire curve to the right. At the top of the curve, we have maximal strength, which is a highly trainable quality. An example of this would be a heavy squat or deadlift. Next is strength speed, which would be something like a jump squat or an Olympic lift. After that is speed strength, which would be like sprinting or jumping. And lastly, there's pure speed. An example of which would be limb movement that's almost completely unresisted, such as a kick or a punch or grabbing a fly out of the air. Unlike maximal force production, the ability to move the limbs at maximal velocity in these types of pure speed movements is largely dictated by genetics and as such is relatively untrainable. It's important to note that the vertical jump exists somewhere around the speed strength section of the continuum. It's not a pure speed movement because there is a substantial resistance at play, which is your own body weight. So while some people are blessed enough to be born with the correct natural blend of speed and strength to produce a crazy vertical jump, even without training for it, for those of us who weren't so lucky, the physical qualities that limit performance in jumping are actually highly trainable because simply acting against the resistance of your own body weight slows the movement down just enough that you can influence the force side of the equation enough to create substantial gain. However, the movement still occurs quickly enough that beyond an intermediate stage of strength training, maximal force production will never be the limiting factor. Rather, the rate of force development i.e. how quickly you can tap into a major portion of your maximal strength will ultimately determine how high you can jump. Think of it like this, a two-footed standing vertical jump, which is the type of jump involving the longest ground contact time, still only takes less than half a second to execute. That means that from the time you start applying force into the ground, you have less than half a second to tap into as much of your strength as possible before your feet leave the ground and you're no longer able to apply force. So, rate of force development is extremely important here, and after a certain point, is almost always going to be the limiting factor in jumping height. Now, having said that, maximal strength is still important for jumping prowess because it's the well that you're drawing from. It doesn't matter if you can tap into 100% of your strength when executing a jump if you're weak to begin with, because you still won't be able to jump high. To jump high, you have to both possess a lot of strength and be able to access a large portion of that strength very quickly. This is what always bothers me about coaches who go around claiming that you can't increase your explosiveness because this line makes people think you can't improve your leaping ability. I mean, yeah, technically they're correct. You can't improve your genetic predisposition for explosiveness, but in spite of that, you sure as hell can improve your leaping ability. And who the hell wants to be right on a technicality anyway? The thing is, we're all born with a given amount of strength and a threshold for how much of that strength we can apply in a short period of time. You can't increase the threshold you're born with, and some people have a higher threshold than others, but you can drastically increase the ceiling, which is determined by maximal strength. And once you've done that, you can then train your rate of force development until it once again reaches your genetic threshold. So while you can't increase explosiveness in a relative sense, and these coaches aren't technically wrong, you can increase the attributes that dictate it in an absolute sense, thereby increasing performance. This is why beginners in the weight room will often see an initial increase in jumping performance when they start increasing their hip and leg strength. Because not only are they increasing their ceiling for the first time, but initial increases in maximal strength also increase the rate of force development to a small degree. Eventually, however, training for maximal force will have no effect on rate of force development, and you can increase your ceiling as high as you want, but if you never shift your focus back onto rate of force development training, your jumping ability will never increase again, because rate of force development isn't able to infinitely keep pace with maximal force development when only low velocity exercises are being employed. Always remember the force velocity curve. Now that I've sufficiently bored you half to death, those of you who've made it this far will be rewarded with my four key exercises for improving your vertical jump. My top picks in this regard are the barbell squat, the power clean, the jump squat, and the box jump. 
These four exercises will cover every relevant point along the force velocity curve and allow you to create an even shifting of the entire curve, which is going to create the potential for the most progress over the longest period of time. Now, I just want to briefly cover a few important points about each exercise. With the squat, the focus should be on creating maximal leg strength. A mid-bar to high-bar positioning is probably the best style to use here, with a focus on maintaining a relatively upright torso and keeping most of the stress of the exercise on the quads. The goal here is to increase maximal force production of the thighs, so getting stronger at the squat over a long period of time is the best and most reliable way to do that. If you need variety, front squats are also a good option. Uh, properly performed pin squats to varying heights can also be utilized in small doses as well as occasional leg pressing and perhaps even box squatting. Next up is the power clean. The focus here should be on moving moderately heavy weights as fast and powerfully as possible. For our purposes, there's no real reason to max out or go too heavy on this exercise because maximal power cleans actually generate a lower peak power than sub-maximal power cleans due to the decreased acceleration of the barbell at heavier weights. Best results will be seen by performing multiple sub-maximal triples in the 70 to 85% range at a frequency of two or even three times a week with a slow upward trending of the load over a long period of time. You can perform these from the floor, from the hang, or even off blocks, or you can substitute them for power snatches or even jerks or high pulls for a period of time. Pretty much any Olympic lift variation will work here as long as the load is kept appropriate and every rep is performed with 100% intent on accelerating the barbell as fast as possible. Next up is the jump squat. The focus here should be on always jumping as high as possible. The mistake most people make with this exercise is going way, way too heavy to see any carryover into actual jumping performance. Think of it like this, we're building a bridge across the strength speed continuum, starting with the most highly trainable physical attribute, which is maximal force production, and working our way across the continuum to strength speed, and finally to speed strength. Each point along the continuum is a stepping stone, and you can't leap from one end to the other without working on all the points in between. We want the jump squats to be light enough to bridge the gap between our Olympic lift variation and our regular unloaded vertical jump. In my case, for instance, as a 500 plus pound squatter, I won't use more than 50 pounds or about 10% of my max squat on these ever. I'll start a cycle with maybe 20 or 30 pounds and gradually work my way up to 50 over a period of a few weeks. When in doubt, don't increase the weight, but rather simply try to jump higher with the same weight. Multiple sets of three reps done twice a week is sufficient here. The final exercise is the box jump. The reason I like the box jump in this slot is because it allows you to accrue a high volume of quality, unloaded jumps without creating any additional landing stress on the hips, knees, and ankles because you get to land on the box rather than fall back to the ground. I know you kiddos don't care about that right now, but once you start getting a little bit older, minimizing joint stress while still being able to perform all these high impact activities, pain free and at a high level, will become one of your primary concerns. And since you'll already be doing loaded jump squats during this time period, you might as well not add to this stress if you don't have to. The key with this exercise is hip displacement i.e. moving your hips as high off the ground as possible with every rep. Really, the height of the box is almost inconsequential. You can certainly use it as a gauge to let you know how high you're jumping on any given day, but it should never be so high that you miss a rep or that you have to land on the box with your butt touching your calves. Sticking the landing in a parallel squat or higher is probably ideal here. Every rep should be maximal, so you should always be jumping as high as possible regardless of the box height you're using. Multiple sets of three to five reps done twice a week is plenty here. Obviously, any other unloaded vertical jumping variation would work in this slot as well, but my point about the cumulative joint stress still stands. Jumping onto a box just makes it easier to get in more volume. Now that you guys know all the exercises you need to reach your peak jumping capacity, here's a quick sample program using the template I've just described, just so you can get a better idea of how to put it all together.
Lastly, since we are talking about vertical jumping, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the stretch shortening cycle. Up to this point, I've essentially described a long-term template for increasing maximal strength, rate of force development, and overall power output that you can pretty much follow for your entire training career and continue to see slow but steady gains on. But no, geez, none of the exercises I've described truly train the stretch shortening cycle, which is its own separate physical quality and is truly the cherry on top of developing a monstrous vertical leap. And the best way to maximize this capacity is with depth jumps which is another exercise that people butcher all the time. Now, a tutorial on how to perform them would be beyond the scope of this video, but as a general rule, they should really only be used as a mechanism for peaking jumping performance prior to a competition or test day. They're fantastic for this purpose. They provide results very quickly and very noticeably in just a matter of weeks, and then the results stagnate just as quickly. They're also very stressful on the body and the joints, but this is partly why they're so powerful. There's a good reason why it's called shock training. For this reason, if jumping as high as possible is your goal, I recommend only incorporating them in short four to six week cycles to peak your jump prior to testing. Multiple sets of four to six jumps done twice a week is plenty here. The focus should be on quality of reps, not quantity. The box I use should be the one that allows you to jump as high as possible and you shouldn't increase the drop height unless you can maintain or improve performance by doing so. Stop doing these as soon as they stop giving you results, which will only be a few weeks, and then perform no jumping exercises for one to two weeks, and then test your vertical jump, and you should see some pretty impressive gains. You'll know if you're on the right track because a couple weeks into it, you'll start to feel like a fucking kangaroo. Seriously, your Achilles tendons become so reactive that every time they touch the ground, you'll feel like you're a coiled spring just ready to bounce away. The gains with this method of training come on so quickly and so drastically that you can literally feel the difference from day to day. It's like looking at yourself in the mirror the minute before and the minute after you've had a haircut. It's pretty cool, actually. When these are done correctly, utilizing appropriate volumes and drop heights, your approach prior to jumping will become much, much more beneficial as your muscles and tendons will now be able to absorb and release far more energy than they could before. But you have to be careful with these. Using too high of a box does nothing but increase your risk of rupturing a tendon, and doing too much volume will actually hinder your results here. Less is more, and quality is the name of the game. When in doubt, use a lower box and do less reps. Anyway, I think that's about it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video and were able to take away some useful bits of information. I know it's a lot to digest, but if you're truly passionate about increasing your vertical jump, everything you need to know is right here, and you can always come back to it and watch it again. If you have any questions about anything, don't hesitate to pass them my way. And if you're interested in my online coaching services, feel free to shoot me an email at oncurry.elite at gmail.com and I'd be happy to send you some more info about what I offer. Other than that, please be sure to like the video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and definitely leave me some love in the comments down below. And lastly, if you truly enjoyed this video, or you just enjoy my content in general, please share some of your favorite stuff somewhere, and together let's make Forest of Wolves Gym one of the biggest fitness channels on YouTube. Keep training hard, and I will catch you guys next time.